Wonderful. Okay. And I'm also going to uh, put you on spotlight so everyone will see you large. Oh, wonderful. We Here we go. So, Sidus Masi, Dr. Twaddle, and I'm very uh, happy to be here um, talking with all of you today about something that is very important to me uh, speaking to our elders, collecting their stories. And so you'll see that throughout this uh, presentation, I'll be in inter interspersing tomorrow sayings, wisdom from our elders. So, listen to the words of the elders because they know best. All right, and in this presentation, I'll be talking about, uh, yeah, so a little bit of my experiences, but also um, that if you want to interview people, either in your family or others um, who have stories that you're interested in, who know things that you'd like to document, um, how to approach it. Um, here we go. And so a lot of my work really comes from these two people. <laughs> these are my grandparents, my mom's parents, uh, Elizabeth Flores, uh, Elizabeth de Leon Flores, who married my grandfather, Joaquin Flores Lujan, Familian Cabeza for my grandmother, and Familian Bittut for my grandfather. And so really, my journey as a Chamorro, my journey as somebody who, uh, who cares about our language, culture, the stories of our elders, our history, a lot of it really begins with these two individuals. My grandfather was a master blacksmith. He taught me and my younger brother how to make traditional tools. And before he died, he also made me promise that I would continue to tell his story. And that one day I would publish it in a book or that I would find different ways to, to keep alive the knowledge of Chamorro blacksmithing. So my goal one day is that uh, Sumahi, my, my oldest child, or Jack, my brother, that they'll draw it and then we can turn his story into a comic book or a graphic novel or something like that. That would be my sort of my hope. My grandmother is the main person who brought me into sort of this world. She's the one who taught me Chamorro when I was a student at the University of Guam, uh, who answered all my ridiculous questions about the language, was incredibly patient and would sometimes giggle at me when I would make mistakes, but would never make me feel like I was wrong or that I shouldn't learn tomorrow. And so she's the one that also, I would take her to parties. I would take her to visit her relatives, her friends. And at first it was a chore to me <laughs> that I didn't look forward to. But as I started to learn tomorrow and as I got more and more into her world, I realized that I enjoyed spending time with her and I enjoyed visiting uh, our elders and spending time with them. And so I started to put it into my research and started interviewing older people, um, collecting their stories. Sometimes it was for a specific purpose. Sometimes it was just to document their story. And so as of today, I've probably interviewed more than 400. Mm -hmm. I've lost count over, over time. <laughs> and sort of what I've collected from that, some of it is in my memory. Some of it is written in notebooks on legal pads. Some of it is recorded on tapes. Some of it is on video. Uh, but my goal one day is to take all of it and put it into some sort of archive so that people can access it to learn more about all that, all those that I that I that I've spoken to and all that I've collected. But so so much that I do about the language, culture, the history, a lot of it begins with with these two. And so why is it important to document the stories of our elders? And so you'll see a lot of images. I was going through my phone and I was going through my Facebook <laughs> to see different pictures because sometimes I've interviewed people and then I didn't take pictures of them. Uh, but to show the importance of why it is, they have stories, they have knowledge of our past. This is uh, Victoria Leon Guerrero, uh, who is interviewing uh, an older woman whose name I can't remember, but for helping her with her war claims, her war reparations application. It's me and my pari, Ed Alvarez, interviewing uh, former speaker, Kin Ariola, who passed away earlier this year. He was one of the last of his generation of post-war leaders on Guam. 
This is me and Robert Underwood when we spent the afternoon visiting with uh, Colonel Scambaluri, my uncle, uh, Adolfo Scambaluri. And so the importance is that they, they have stories about our island, our culture. They have stories about our ancestors and our elders. They have stories about the village. They have stories about why you are who you are, why our island is the way it is. Sometimes those start stories might feel big, sometimes they might feel small, but they are precious because they are ours, right? They are ours. And so it's important for us that we speak to our elders so that we can feel that connection to them, so that we can feel like, like uh, whatever they were, whatever they represented, it wasn't lost, that we have held on to some of it, that, that we can pass it on to the next generation. But one thing that I want to highlight, which is often forgotten, though, is, uh, oh, and so one saying, for example, Isalapi un sosotda un zudzukti, lo uno hananamo. So why are our elders important? Because all the money that you make, you can, you can get, you can throw away, whether you buy a new car, whether you try to buy Twitter, you know, whether you spend it all on fancy clothes, lo uno hananamo. But all of the things that you collect in life cannot replace those things that you are gifted with at birth from your family. And so it's important that we talk to our elders because they are irreplaceable. That no matter how much money you make, you cannot replace what your grandparents were to what your grandparents were to you or what your parents were to you. And so this is the wisdom of this Chamorro saying. No matter all the money that you make, you're always going to find a way to get rid of it, but you will always have only one mother. And Chamorro sayings are always funny. There's almost no sayings about how fathers are awesome. There are lots of sayings about how mothers are awesome. I don't know if that's the matrilineal culture rising up. All right, but collecting their stories is important for them as well. And this is something that we often forget. We think about that we want their stories, we wanna learn, we wanna know. But it's very, very important that we create the space so that they can tell us what they remember, that they can tell us who they are. This is so important because remember that for our grandparents, for our great grandparents, these were people who lived under colonial conditions. These were people who were told that their culture was, was worthless, that their language was worthless, that their land was worthless, that they were worthless. And whether they believed it or not, they ultimately lived with all of these pressures of feeling inferior or that you're not good enough and that you need to, uh, you need to give your children something else. You need to give them the English language. You need to send them to the States. You need to teach them other people's ways because whatever they are isn't good enough. And so taking their stories is important to give them a sense of value in the world. Right, And because our elders lived through and inherited a great deal of trauma, sort of your average person who is 80 years old today or even 70, 70 plus years old lived through a, a number of things. They most likely were punished for speaking Chamorro in schools and had a, have a lot of built up trauma over that over learning a language in home and then going into school and being told that that language is bad and that language gets you in trouble. They, most, they lived through the war, saw, experienced oppression or saw it and witnessed it. But the war also brought untold destruction and a, a massive uprooting of their way of life, dramatic changes within just a generation or two. They also most likely had their land taken and that this is something which is which we know about, but it's not properly understood. The impact of families that had land for generations, that that fed themselves, that provided for themselves, that suddenly within a few years had nothing except for the pennies that the US Navy gave them. And so this image of a Chamorro, an older Chamorro woman receiving a check for her land, and the, the Navy governor at that time 
sort of smiling, thinking that this is a great thing, that we are giving you this money. But if you look at this woman's face, it tells you volumes about what she was feeling in that moment. Even something such as typhoons, sort of the trauma of typhoons, natural disasters, which are frequent in this part of the world, and how uh, typhoons um, often have led to dramatic changes in lives, right? So if you grew up in the 50s, you may have grown up in a house that was made of wood and tin, or you may have grown up in a house which had a thatched roof. But within a generation, almost all of those types of houses are gone. And whatever life was attached to those houses is also gone as well. And so our aunts, our, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, they have this trauma. And a lot of times there's no space to talk about this trauma. There's, there's few people that are asking them questions about this that are, that are trying to help them work through it, right? A lot of times they just kind of say it happened and then that's it, or they don't talk about it. And so it's important that in your collection of their stories, you give them space so that they can say things that maybe they felt they weren't allowed to say before, right? And that's something that I've experienced a lot, sitting with people and talking to them at length, sometimes hours, sometimes days, and then finally coming to the point where they'll share something, they'll share something that they have felt for the longest time that they couldn't share that it wasn't okay to share, it wasn't patriotic to share it, or that it was disrespectful to share it, or that it doesn't matter if they share it, right? So always remember this, is that speaking to our elders, getting their stories, giving them the space to talk, to, to reflect, is so critical for their own sense of healing. This is something personally that I've experienced for many elders who have trouble passing on the language to their children or their grandchildren, Right, is that if you give them the space and you empower them to rediscover the language, then they will, they will speak it to everybody. But you have to give them that space. You have to give them that support. And so in Chamorro, they say, If you plant it, it will grow. And so next to me here, this is the late Jose Mata Torres. Tato Maleso from the village of Maleso. And one thing that you can give your elders by talking to them, by making them feel like they are the celebrity, right? That they are, they are more important than whatever you're binge watching on Netflix. They are more important than whatever is happening with uh, Brad Pitt and Angelo, Angelina Jolie or something like that. If you make them feel like that, you are giving them the sense that whatever they have, whatever, whoever they are, by telling you and talking to you, they are planting seeds, which means that something that is important to them, a lesson, a story, something about their life, something about the life of their parents, that those are seeds that will be planted and that, and that by you taking it, it means that it'll continue to grow. And whether elders talk about that, everybody thinks about that wanting to feel like something that you are will persist and live on. And this is especially important for indigenous people because we may not think of ourselves on a daily basis as indigenous people, but one thing that we have inherited from colonization is a feeling that we are limited, we are stuck, that the future belongs to somebody else. And that, that's something that even if you're uh, even if your Nana didn't take a class in post-colonial studies, then your Nana may feel that. And so we need to push against that. We need to break that. Now, when starting these types of interviews, now remember, you can do these with anybody. It doesn't have to be with your own relatives. It could be anybody who you feel has something important to offer. You have to first ask yourself, what kind of person am I talking to? Are they a person who shares freely? Are they a person who has no trouble talking? Or are they a person who is more quiet and guarded, right? So for example, this is, a, this is a, here in the middle here, this is former Senator Marilyn Manabusum. So she was a Senator for a long time and she's comfortable speaking at length. She has no problem talking. 
right? So if you ask her to talk to you about her family, her experiences, you know, she may be a little bit mamalo, but she has no trouble sort of putting it all into a narrative. This is Juan Benevente from the village of Dededo. He was a, uh, he was a longtime veteran, uh, Vietnam vet, war survivor, uh, US Army, um, also the campaign manager for Angel Santos's first run for Senator. And so he, uh, he has no trouble talking either. He has, his, he has his life story sort of in a narrative. And if you have four hours, then he will tell you his whole life story. Now, this over here is Jose Salas, Joseph Salas. So Joseph Salas was one of the commanders for the, he was, uh, he was actually uh, in the secret service before during Watergate. He has stories from that time that he will not tell, no matter how many times I ask him. And uh, he, uh, he was in the Guam National Guard in the first Persian Gulf War, and he was one of the commanders that led the only reserve unit from the Pacific to go to Kuwait and to Iraq. And so he has stories, but he's always very guarded. He's always very closed off. He, 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 he gives short answers. And so this is a picture of him donating uh, his uniform and, and his stuff from his unit that went to Iraq. And so for him, it's always tough because he, uh, he gives short answers. He doesn't elaborate. It's hard for him to put it all into a longer narrative. And so you have to think, who are you talking to? What is their relationship to speaking publicly? And that can make a big difference, right? And so uh, always remember that don't, if it's somebody who isn't comfortable speaking publicly uh, or doesn't talk about these things often, then, then don't just expect them to give it to you because you turned a tape recorder on, right? You may need to find other ways to reach them, right? And so a key thing before you begin is that comfort is key, right? Where are you going to talk to them? If it's a place which they're more comfortable at, that's better, right? So oftentimes people feel more comfortable in their homes, right? If you take them somewhere that's strange, like let's say you say, oh, why don't we go down to the TV station and I'll interview, and you interview in front of a big cameras. A lot of people might get scared at something like that, right? If you, but if you can interview them in a space that's more comfortable for them, right? Um, also, who are you, who is with you when you are interviewing them, right? So, for example, um, this is uh, uh, Juan and Marion Babauta. They were they grew up in the village of Sumai. They live in they lived in Santa Rita, and so when I was interviewing them their whole family was behind me. <laughs> so that makes it easier for them to talk with their family there. This is Tony Baza, uh, who, um, who lives in, who's lived in Washington, DC since the fifties. And so for Tony Baza, he, he had no trouble. He'll talk to you anywhere about his story. He enjoys talking and reflecting and learning things. So he's very open. This is the father of my uh, Pari Ed Alvarez. This is Joe Alvarez. And so he, Joe Alvarez too, he, uh, he enjoyed having people around him when he talked like it. And so some, some elders like the theatrics of it, right? They like to sort of, it's part of uh, the spectacle of being in front of people and sharing your story. Other people want a space in which there's less people, in which it's more private. And remember, some people will not want to be recorded, right? You may have that experience with an elder who will talk nonstop and share their story. And the moment you take out your phone and start recording, Todd's up. They have nothing to say. Because so remember that, that if, uh, if they don't want video recorded, then record audio only. If they don't want audio recorded, then just take notes. Right, but make sure that they are comfortable, that they're in a space where they can share. And remember to develop an approach that is appropriate for who you're talking to, right? So on the left here, this is Jose Iglesias Leon Guerrero. 
he was a Vietnam vet. He was an officer, one of the, you know, one of the few Chamorros who was sort of a higher officer at that time in Vietnam. Uh, and he, uh, he also ran for Lieutenant Governor. And so for him, you know, I gave him a list of questions um, and then he was fine. He answered all the questions. He was very comfortable. On the right here, I cannot remember her last name. This is Senora Helen from the village of Malesso. But for her, she kind of just wanted to chat. So, so this is at a Wendy's, Wendy's and Hagatnya. So you kind of just meet with her and then she'll kind of just tell you stories from that she remembers from her elders, right? And so didn't give her like a, a list of things necessarily, but sort of she just, uh, you know, she would share stuff and then I would ask questions and then she would respond, but much more organic, right? So some people will appreciate a more formal approach. You give them questions, they can think about them. Other people will feel better if it's more organic, right? So I have interviewed some people where literally I just, uh, you know, go visit them during lunch. And whatever they tell me, they tell me. And some people feel really comfortable like that, right? You just kind of share food together and you talk. There's no pressure. It's just like part of life, right? And if you if they feel that pressure, then they might get closed off. They might, parts of their brain might not feel free. They might not give you as much. So don't feel, even if you are a, like a, a scholar or an academic, remember that not all people respond to that. And that some people will feel uh, insecure if you, if you bring that to them. Some people will enjoy it. Some people will like it. Some people will feel like uh, it's, it's not right for them or you're looking down on them because they maybe didn't go to school a lot. Maybe they didn't graduate from school. Maybe they were told that they were stupid for speaking tomorrow, right? So develop an approach that matches whoever you're talking to. Don't try to force them into something, right? Because I used to make all my students for Guam history and for Chamorro language do oral history interviews with somebody in their family or somebody in their community. And it was always interesting because some elders, you know, you would put the recorder in front of them and they would just go. And then uh, like students would say, Senor, uh, what was the time limit for, what was the minimum for the oral history recording? And I'd say, oh, you know, it needed to be 30 minutes. And they're like, my grandma spoke for two hours. And it's like, oh, blessings, blessings from Fauna. Then you would have some people where they would read the list of suggested questions I gave, and they would come out with an interview that was five minutes long. Because you would say, oh, you know, did your parents tell you any stories when you were growing up? No. Oh, do you remember your neighbors when you were growing up? No. <laughs> And so some people just gave interviews like that. Do you, do you know any legends? No. And it's, they do, they do know, but you have to sort of, you have to talk to them or you have to find them. You have to create the space where they feel comfortable, right? And so in conducting this type of work, all that you throw ahead, you will surely find which has a lot of meanings, but one of the meanings is that all the work, everything that you do ahead of time will pay dividends when you, when you reach that point. So this is a reminder that the research that you bring, the research that you bring to your interviews will help you greatly. So all that you can learn ahead of time before you talk to somebody to help jog their memories, to help fill in gaps, this is so important. So if you just go in and you don't know anything about the time, if, if whoever you're talking to, if your elder is having trouble remembering, or they say they don't know, um, you may not be able to help them. But if you've done research ahead of time, you'll be able to sort of uh, guide them. You'll be able to sort of, maybe you can say something that might trigger their memory on this topic, right? So for example, one thing that I've learned where I've learned that this is very helpful is in terms of school, school experiences, right? 
school experiences. So these are images of schools. This is the Maxwell School, which was in Sumai. This is the, this is the school that my grandmother taught at uh, before World War II. Uh, this is either the GW class from 1940 or 1941. This is the graduating class. This might be 41. It, then this is my this is my grandmother's class. This is the GW class of 1946, right? And so this is the first graduating class after World War II, I think, or it might be 45. I think it's 46. But um, and so, so what we need to remember is that the experiences of school children at that time was that school was a very alienating experience, right? And so many, many young children didn't know who their, you know, didn't know who their principals were because it was probably, it may have been a, a man from the States who was just on island for a few years. Um, eventually more Chamorros became involved in education and then so people become more familiar with them. But it may be a very long time ago. It, and so I'm, you know, I, I used to tease my grandfather about this because he couldn't remember the names of his teachers. I am 42 years old and I struggle to remember the names of my elementary school teachers. But if you, if you showed me a picture of them, I might <laughs> remember. Or if you told me a name of a teacher that was at the school at that time, I might remember. So this is why if you just ask a question, and I've had this experience so many times, you say, oh, who did you go to school with? You know, what did you, what did you learn in school, right? If you just kind of ask general questions, sometimes people struggle. It was a long time ago. It wasn't a positive or, in, or enriching experience for some people. But if you can look up and name, like this is in the Guam Museum collection, uh, earlier this year, we had somebody donate a set of George Washington High School yearbooks from the year 1949. And so if you can look, if you can find the names of teachers at that time, if you can find pictures of the school or of people at that time, it's something that can greatly help. So if you can bring prior research to the conversation, it'll absolutely help. So that's why um, like I've had this experience where I ask somebody, oh, who was your teacher when you were at that school? And they can't remember. But if I name a teacher that I know from that time, like I say, oh, maybe um, was uh, Lagrimas Antalan your teacher? Or was uh, Remedio Perez your teacher? And, and then they say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, she was my, my, my brother's teacher. Right? And then sort of the general question didn't work, but the question, but when asked again with relevant information from that time, which can take them back, right? Then you'll find that they'll remember. So do that research. And for, I definitely encourage people that if you have the ability to use like the website, uh, newspapers.com, I highly encourage it because they have almost all of the Guam Daily News, so the newspaper from the 1950s up until the 60s. And so it's a great thing to help trigger memories, right? You may find a reference into it. Now, the, the newspaper wasn't great for talking about local things, but it did feature sometimes pictures of Chamorros, sometimes stories about them. And so whatever you can bring to help you. And so for the last part here, let's talk about senses. Li'i, to see, Ningi, to smell, Hunguk, to hear, Tanya, to taste, Patsa, to touch. Senses are very, very important in terms of helping people remember things, right? And um, we oftentimes prioritize sort of hearing information, hearing a question, or seeing something. But a lot of times, sort of the strongest senses the strongest uh, sense memories are for things that you wouldn't really expect. And this is especially true if something hasn't been felt in a sensory way in a very long time. Bringing that 
into your into your conversation can be very very helpful and so uh what's it called so let's just take a step back this is the village of Inarahan before world war ii and so if you are on guam you can look outside your window into your village and i bet it looks exactly like this no it doesn't can you imagine what it sounded like to live in a place like this? What it smelt like? What it felt like? You know, what did the what did things taste like? Right? Remember that um, the diet of Chamorros at this time was very different than it is today, right? What would even something as simple as the bed that you sleep on, the floor that you walk on? right? These things would be very, very different in terms of how they feel. And so if you are dealing with somebody who lived before World War II, or even grew up in the late 1940s, um, and if they're having trouble remembering, it's, it's useful for you to try to take a step back and sort of imagine, imagine what things were like back then, and imagine ways that you can bring elements of that into the present to help take them back right because i can tell you this uh now on guam most almost everybody lives in a concrete house some people still live in wood houses but even something as simple as concrete in your houses makes them feel different gives you a different relationship to the world outside of the house right sort of one thing for for me nowadays like the sound of an air con like I'm because Guam has air conditioning now, just about everywhere you go, I'm so used to that sound. If I am indoors and I don't hear an air con, I feel like something is wrong. Something is amiss in the universe. Right? So the air conditioning is a sound for me. What would have been the sounds for somebody who grew up in the 1930s or in the 1940s? Right? And so that can work sometimes, actually. That can work. One thing, uh, one thing that you may experience, for example, if you've talked to people on Guam, is that a lot of uh, sometimes elders like to be interviewed behind their house outdoors instead of inside their house. And part of that, too, is the stronger connection to the outside, the feeling of the air sweating, right, as opposed to even just sweating, as opposed to the way we live now sort of not feeling the air or the heat as much. Now, when trying to talk to people, you can always try to take them back to places that are key in their memories. This can be difficult though, this can be difficult because if it's that long ago, then things have changed. This is a scene from the, from the making of the documentary, The War for Guam. So this is a very young me. This is like a 22-year-old me. <laughs> and so we are interviewing uh, the late Tony Artero. Uh, he liked to call himself the submariner because there's like nine Tony Arteros. So he was the submariner Artero because he was in the Navy and then he served on submarines. And so for him, we interviewed him in, a, in, in sort of a, a studio. This, but we also went to places that were key to his story. And so the area behind him where this McDonald's used to be, this was his family's land that was taken by the US Navy, uh, by the US military after World War II. And so if you can take people back and so um, to a spot, it can help. But a lot of times it's difficult nowadays, right? Because of how things have changed. So a lot of times the spot, the areas themselves don't create, don't help people remember because they just reinforce how distant that time is from today. But sometimes it can help, especially if there are features that are similar, if there's natural features, if there's plants in the area, but sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Photographs can definitely help. This is from uh, this was one of the highlights of my September at the Guam Museum was that um, 
a U.S. Navy man named John Kurtz, who's, who is this guy right here. He's in his 80s now. He, uh, he served in, uh, in the U.S. Navy for one tour, and he was sent to Guam. And he, while he was on Guam, he began to date this woman right here, Diana or Diana Beneventi. And he lived in a house that the family had, and uh, he took pictures of them, hundreds of pictures of the family. And so he reached out to us at the Guam Museum, and Bobby Beneventi, who some of you may know, a social worker on Guam, uh, she uh, she helped connect me to people who were in the pictures. So what we who we have here in this uh, Zoom room are members of the Beneventi family, the children of Eloy Beneventi, and the siblings of Diana Beneventi. And so we we were in a Zoom room uh, for more than an hour, looking through the pictures, recording their memories as they looked at the pictures, right? And for some of them, it's these are things that they hadn't thought about in decades, right? And the fact that they were all together, they were all looking at pictures, really helped bring out all of these memories, especially of their sister, who died uh, about 40 years or 40 years ago or so. But it was really nice to hear stories of her. She was a, she was a, they, they all said that she was a strong and assertive woman for the time. She had a, a U.S. Marine uh, soon after the war had, uh, she had been in, married to him. He had left Ireland and left her with their three kids and she was raising them alone uh, in the early 60s. And so pictures are very, very helpful, right? Um, bring out a big pile of pictures, right? And, and even if you, if, and if they are at the, and even if you know who some of the people are, ask your elders who they are, have them tell you who they are, right? It's always important to play the sort of the young child to the elder, especially if they feel insecure, let them be in charge. Let them, you know, let them sort of just say, oh, I don't know, what, what's this? What is this? What's this, right? Just be, you know, pretend like you are a young child like the way, you know, asking your grandparents to tell you what these flowers are around the house or what these trees are in the jungle, right? So give that earnestness to it and then just ask questions. And so pictures are very, very helpful, right? <clears throat> but if you don't have pictures, right? Because if you are going back further then pictures were very common, then you have to rely on other things. And so songs, songs and music can be very, very helpful, right? And so these are singers from uh, Lansun Antigua, which was one of the first Chamorro cultural villages down in the village, down in Inarahan. You may recognize some of the people here. She, this is Tan Florin um, Meno or Paulino, Meno or Paulino. And so she, uh, she passed away either I believe this year or last year, she was a master weaver and she was a, a common, uh, one of the elders who was at the Gefpago cultural village. And she was at Lanson Antigo before that. And so this is uh, Sus Chrysostomo who was a master Belambatudzen player. And so music takes people back, right? But what kind of music? What kind of music, right? Um, I mean, this is true for all of us, right? Is that if, uh, uh, if I hear a, a Backstreet Boys song, I'm taken back to the 90s, right? And so, but what type of music? So the Bellum Batudzen is, is not a song, it's not an instrument that is commonly heard today. And if you can, and for some people though, that can trigger very deep memories because it was a sound which is very distinct back in the day um, it's a one-stringed instrument, right? Uh, originally, it would be it would be fiber. Eventually, when metal became more common in Guam, they replaced the the, the string with metal, and so it was a very distinct sound. But it was very common at parties because things like guitars you didn't make on Guam. You had to they had to be imported. You had to buy them, but anybody could make a bellum batuzan, 
and then play it and then learn to play it. And so sometimes I found that the sound of the Bella Batuts and really brings people back to sort of gatherings long time ago when those instruments were common. And so one song which definitely takes people back, I'll play a little bit of it here for all of you is Angumupu Si Paluma. That song is from the, so this is the instrumental orchestral version from the, the record, uh, The Music and Legends of Guam by Jack DeMello. And so you'll find different versions of it. Johnny Sablon, of course, recorded his own version of it, which is one of the most famous versions of it. But Angumupu Si Paluma is a song that every Chamorro knew. And it was part of the, the, the tradition of Chamorita songs, where there was tunes that everybody knew and then somebody can start a song using that tune um, and for Ngumupu si Paluma you usually started it with the, the line Ngumupu si Paluma when the bird flies and then after that you make up the next three lines before handing the song off to somebody else who then responds with four lines of their own and so this is a tune which literally everybody knew and everybody sung it made up their own songs or sung other people's versions of it and so sometimes this type of music can really help take people back um especially if they haven't heard it in a long time and so i definitely recommend music music but he guy or thatch is something that if you grew up in a time when people lived in houses like these, then that was a very important smell and feel. The feel, uh, the feel of coconut leaf and the smell of coconut leaf, right? And so it being sort of all around you. And so that, and another thing which can definitely help is the feel of ephod or the smell of ephod. Many young people, especially if you grew up before World War II or even in the 40s, you know, you lived in a house which there might have been ephod floors and you might have had to polish the ephod floors with coconut. And so people talk about those things. People know about these things. You can see pictures of these things, but sort of the feel of it or the smell of it can really trigger memories. Right, it can really help take somebody back at, to that time, right? So that's why, for example, um, for example, uh, bringing in woven things, if you're talking to somebody, you know, having coconut or taking them to a place in which there's thatch, right? Or there's the, in which they can see it, in which they can be around it, they can feel it. This can absolutely bring out things 
that they probably hadn't thought about in a long time, right? Living in a in a concrete structure for for most of their life, taking you know, so helpful in taking people back. And so, maps and documents can also be very very helpful. Um, on the left here, this is uh, Frank Francisco Cruz, who uh, who uh, who. Uh, Earlier this year, he called me at the Guam Museum wanting to sort of document his family's story in the war, but also asked for maps because he had lost family members during the war and he had wanted to find on maps exactly where they were killed by the Japanese and where things happened to him and his family. And so I found whatever maps I could and then I spent, the, you know, I spent a few mornings at his house sort of going over them and talking, talking to him about his story. On the right here, this is uh, this man is actually not Chamorro. This is uh, Masao Arume. He is Okinawan. And so he grew up on Saipan before World War II. So his, his, uh, his, his parents worked for the Japanese in Saipan before the war. And so when I was visiting Okinawa once, I connected to, I because I was a friend of his, his granddaughter. And so I spent the afternoon talking to him about his memories of Saipan before the war and during the war. And so same thing, he had maps and the maps for him really helped him because it had been so long ago and it had been so distant that the maps were so important in him being able to, to move his finger along and then talk about point at things as he was talking about the, uh, talking about a place and that sort of, uh, that was really helpful, having something to reference uh, while, he was, while he was talking and remembering. And so whatever you have that would help sort of remember, help, help uh, whoever you're talking to sort of remember and get into that moment and get into that time, right? Because, because our memory is right. It's not sort of like every, everything is in the same place. Memories end up in certain areas, and if you don't use them for a while, it's harder to get to them. So whatever you can use to help somebody reach that, reach that point. And so you may have noticed that in my presentation in the PowerPoint, the Chamorro sayings were sort of old typewriter font. And so even something as simple as the sound of a typewriter can help take people back, right? the look or the feel of a typewriter. Because uh, my girlfriend Desiree got this for me for my, for my birthday, sort of an old typewriter that doesn't use, it uses like a ribbon, doesn't use electricity, right? And sort of whenever people who grew up typing hear it, it, it just takes them back. It's like, oh, I remember when I had to learn how to use a typewriter in school, <laughs> right? And so, anything can be used to trigger you just have to kind of figure out what can help what can help somebody remember what can help take them back and so finally one more Chamorro saying this is a picture of my grandmother the night that she passed away this is a picture of my oldest child Sumahi her hand between my two grandparents hands as we were saying goodbye to my grandmother and so the last thing that I want to leave you with is don't trust tomorrow because it isn't yours. And so I say this, though, because when my grandmother, you know, I love talking to my grandmother, asking her questions, learning from her. When she started to become sick and when she was bedridden, you know, I... I started to write down questions that I would ask her when she started feeling better. And she never really ever got up out of the bed again. You know, she was bedridden for a while. And so I would just kind of keep writing down questions uh, that I wanted to ask her as soon as she was feeling better. And then I never ever got to that list of questions. And so if you have people in your life who are still around, who hold stories that will be important to your family, who hold stories that will be important to you or your children, or your grandchildren, 
don't trust tomorrow. Tomorrow isn't yours, right? This is the tomorrow saying that which can be done today should be done now, right? So if you have people in your family, reach out to them and start the process of talking to them. You know, because I have had, um, I've had a number of students who may have hated the fact that I assigned them uh, a project where they had to interview their grandparents or interview an elder when they were in my class. And then a number of them over the years have reached out to me and said, thank you for making me do that. Because that was, that was Tata's life story. Or that was, um, you know, that was uh, the last chance that I spent a long time talking to my grandma before she started to, to lose her memory from dementia. Right? And so I encourage all of you and I offer this too, that if you have relatives who are on Guam, who are older, I am happy to interview them. I love to do this. If, even if you have relatives who are in the States, if you can put them in front of a laptop over Zoom, I am happy to interview them. And we can record it, and then you can have that, and it can always be there for your family. But if you have those that you want to talk to, don't wait. Start talking to them now. All right. Sidus Masi. I hope that all of you found that uh found that uh interesting or helpful in some ways. Yes, Tan Flor and Paulino Hungan. Oh yes, and so I don't have much time before uh my before I'm gonna run over to my class, but does anyone have any quick questions? I See, oh, so one thing, so one thing to, to keep in mind about Chamorro is that um, it may be easier, but some people who may have trauma over the language, you may need to get them comfortable first, right? So, and I, and I, the last, for the last presentation I did, I shared an experience with an older woman who had a lot of trauma, not just from being punished in school, but also that uh, her husband, would would uh, get angry at her for speaking Chamorro to their kids. And it became sort of part of the conflict in their relationship as husband and wife. And so it was really painful for her to speak Chamorro because like to like in a, in a, in a non-comfortable setting. So she could speak to those that she had always spoken to, but she had trouble speaking to me and it eventually made her cry and break down because I was asking her to speak Chamorro to me. And so for people who have that type of insecurity about the language, it's okay. Let them speak in English, but encourage them. Speak a little bit of Chamorro. And eventually, you can bring it out of them. But many, remember, many elders will say, oh, you know, I can't say this in Chamorro because I didn't go to school for Chamorro. They'll say something like that. And that you just have to help them understand and feel that that's not true, that that's not important that it's their story. And, and if they can speak tomorrow, then they can say it in tomorrow, but you just have to go, get them past those feelings of hesitancy. Uh, <laughs> there you go, yearbooks. Oh, oh, wonderful, yes. Thank you for all your questions and your introductions. Oh. But yes, if some of you have elders, and uh, if I can help you do with your interview, or if you would like me to do it, uh, I'm very, very uh, willing to help. I have uh, lists of questions that I often ask people, sort of uh, basic questions. Um, one of my constraints now is that when I was like a graduate student, I would interview people sometimes like for an entire afternoon, multiple days, spending lots of time with them. And I don't have time like that anymore in my schedule. So usually interviews now are one, two, three hours um, just because, but, but I still have like long lists of questions for that I, you know, for the stuff that I like to ask people or, or have students ask people. 
And so just uh, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to, to help with that. I just want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Vivacqua for uh, for giving this amazing presentation. Uh, Michael, that was fantastic. I, I also love the longer, more rambling version as you described it on Wednesday. So <laughs> that was, <laughs> but this was the more succinct uh, formal presentation and uh, we thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to invite you back on this topic sometime next year um, because uh, it's I think it's such an important and valuable way to think about caregiving and uh, and also just to 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 pass on our family stories to to future generations. So uh, thank you for your presentation. I'd also just like to say thank you to everyone that came out today. I know a number of you are. Uh, uh, members of our support group for family caregivers of persons with dementia, and a number of you are students of Dr. Vivacqua's. I just wanted to let you know that if you're interested in in, in our group on uh, focused on caregivers of persons with dementia, um, I put my email address in the chat. We meet every Wednesday evening from 6 to 8, and on Saturday mornings from 10 to 12. So, sometimes we, we change the time like we did today, but usually we're 10 to 12. Reminiscence Therapy is a series that we're doing uh, this, uh, this semester. Gillette Leon Guerrero presented uh, on this topic uh, last month, and we'll be having other speakers as well, and we'll be inviting Dr. Vivacqua back. But if you're interested in learning more about uh, dementia care um, and our support program, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. We're with the School of Health Guam Micronesia Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program under Dr. Mike, uh, sorry, Dr. Margaret Vittorio Chima at uh, University of Guam. And um, uh, anyways, my email address is in the chat there. Thanks, everyone. I know, Dr. Bavakwa, you've got another class to go to, so we better let you go. And if okay. anyone has any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, I wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. So if you're in my class, I'm going to open the Zoom room now. I'll see you over there. All right, Sidus Masi, Dr. Twaddle. Thank you, Dr. Vakwa.